So thank you. This is the Reos Contra Cancer uh, SBIR SBRT lecture series, and this is the second lecture. Uh, the title is Radiation Biology of Hypofractionation. I'm Steve Brown in Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and this is Detroit in the distance. The picture was taken from Canada, and that's where I live. And the water in between is the Detroit River, and that becomes Niagara Falls. So next slide. In the last lecture, uh, Jose Garcia Ramirez told us about uh, stereotac the physics of stereotactic radiosurgery, stereotactic radiotherapy, and SBR SBRT. And in these, of course, doses are high. And so this lecture is on the radiobiology of high doses. And the doses we're talking about are um, above 12 gray, uh, but really think the biology changes at between 8 to 10 gray. Okay, there's three objectives, two important ones. The first is to review classical radiobiology, the concepts that govern um, low-dose radiation. The second objective is to review uh, new biology, uh, things that happen at high dose. And then the third is to present, uh, in a cursory way, um, future research. So the outline then is uh, to cover the um, important factors governing radiobiology uh, response at low doses. And these, of course, are summarized by the four or maybe five R's of radiobiology. Repair, and this is all happening on the cellular level. So repair of cells, uh, reassortment, or sometimes called redistribution of cells in the cell cycle, reoxygenation, uh, repopulation, which is just growing, cells that, that divide. And then uh, more recently, especially for high-dose radiation, uh, radiosensitivity. And we'll cover in detail how the radiosensitivity can change. Uh, and that's the second part of the talk, the biology of high-dose radiation. Some say there's a direct effect of vascular injury due to the high dose of radiation. Others think there's an indirect damage that occurs in the time after vascular injury. There's another group of scientists and clinicians that say immunology is the most important thing governing the response of high dose radiation. And there's probably other um, factors that are involved. And then finally, I'll talk about future direction. Okay, by way of background, radiation, of course, generates free radicals. And these are short-lived moieties that direct either, that interact either directly with uh, the, the matter that they um, cause damage to or indirectly, and that means through water. And of course, water is the most abundant component of the cell. Now, if the water or whatever the, wherever the free radicals are formed is a short distance from the DNA, that's when the consequence occurs. The next slide. This shows a cell, and of course, radiation is a random process, so everything in the cell is fair game. Uh, the radiation mostly interacts with water, since that's 80, 90 percent of the cell, but it also interacts with lipids and proteins and carbohydrates, and those have really no consequence uh, because there's duplication in the cell. However, there's 1% of the cell that's made up of DNA and RNA, and it's really the DNA that matters, of course, because there is only one double-stranded copy. And if that's damaged, a muscle cell may still be a muscle cell, and a brain cell may be a brain cell function properly. But when the cell tries to divide, the damage will be manifest. Next slide. Okay, so what happens at low doses? At low doses, the radiation killing is due to a double strand break. And that is considered lethal because there's no secondary strand to give a template to repair the damage. And this is in contrast to single strand breaks, which are really the majority of the damage and the majority that's repaired. Next slide. So at low doses, 
we can write the function, the relationship between dose and surviving fraction as the surviving fraction is, and here alpha is proportional to dose, and this is linearly, since a single hit, which is a double strand break that's responsible for death, uh, must be uh, due to a double strand break. Next slide. Okay, of course, at higher doses, radiation cell killing is a consequence of accumulated damage. These single hits, if close enough together, cause effectively a double strain break or a, a double tear modulation. So at higher doses, the relationship is surviving fraction is proportional to dose squared. Since cell death is a consequence of two single strand breaks that are sufficiently close that the cell can't repair itself or that the DNA cannot repair itself. Okay, what happens at very high doses? Radiation killing is much more complex and of course an area of intense research. But what comes out, at least that's clear, is that at high doses, the biology doesn't follow the same rules at the lower doses. So for the majority of, of radiation doses that are encountered, encountered in the clinic, the surviving fraction SF is related to dose by, of course, the linear quadratic relationship, where surviving fraction is uh, logarithmic or exponentially related to this term minus alpha D, and here alpha is the constant of proportionality for double strand break damage, minus beta D squared, and beta is for the coefficient for single strand damage. And so alpha D dominates at low doses and beta D squared at high doses. So this, these graphs show the relationship of surviving fraction as a function of dose under um, linear, linearly plotted and logarith logarithmically plotted uh, just for convenience. And so focusing on the logarithmic plot um, at the low doses, uh, alpha D dominates at the higher doses, which is really a quadrant. Oh, and I should say, at the low doses, that linear um, constant or linear curve that's dominating, uh, the slope of the line is alpha. And um, at the higher doses, the relationship is a quadratic, and of course, beta is what says how curvy the curve is. And the ratio of alpha beta, I'm sure you're aware has clinical implications. So even though these are cells growing in a dish, the ratio of alpha beta has implications for all normal tissue. Uh, and that is that normal tissue can be divided into one of two categories, either a small alpha beta for late responding tissue and uh, where repair is important, uh, or a large alpha beta for acutely responding tissue. Now that's beyond this lecture, but it's interesting that this relationship that comes out of cell uh, kinetics uh, has implications in the clinic. Next slide. Okay, operationally, there's two terms that are defined for repair. There's potentially lethal damage, and that's the component of injury that can be modified by changing the microenvironment of the cells. So if you irradiate cells, and then these are cells in a dish, and then you give nice fresh media to the cells, you would think the cells are happy and that they would survive better. But in fact, the opposite happens. The cells are damaged. They should stop and they should repair. But they don't because they feel good. And so they try to divide even though they really should have repaired that damage. And when they divide, that's when the damage is manifest. So operationally, by definition, potentially lethal damage refers to damage that happens when the microenvironment of the cells is changed after radiation. Another term is sublethal damage, and that's the component of injury where there's two doses of radiation and repair occurs between the two doses. And so that has to do with time, the time after a radiation exposure or the time before a second dose of radiation. And of course, there's potentially lethal damage repair that happens 
when the microenvironment of the cells change, and sublethal damage repair that depends on the timing between two doses of radiation. Next slide. So we're talking about one to two hours for the half time of repair, and that's pretty quick. And because of that, phases of the cells, uh, as the cells as they, as they go through the cell cycle, have uh, different repair capabilities. Um, mitosis, late G2, just before the cell tries to divide and during cell division, uh, they don't have much repair capacity because they don't have much time to repair. They're ready to divide, and once they divide, that damage is manifest. It's passed on to the daughter cells. S phase, of course, is the most repair, has the most repair capacity because the DNA is open. S phase is where the cell is synthesizing its DNA, and all the proteins are available to the DNA that if damage occurs, it can be repaired at that time. Next slide. Okay, this shows a cell cycle. And um, I just want to make the point that cells in late G2 and M are preferentially killed, and cells in the S phase are preferentially spared. And that after a dose of radiation, because cells in late G2 and M are killed, and cells in S phase are spared, there's a difference in the proportion of cells. Through that cell, through the cell cycle. And um, in fact, if the dose is big enough, the cells will pile up in mitosis and they won't want to divide. If the dose is too high, the cells will actually be killed, they'll be forced through mitosis. So this doesn't have major impact in SBRD or for high dose radiation, um, except to say that um, it, if the dose is low enough for the cells to survive, then it will. Um, synchronize the cells through the cell cycle. And if it's big enough, then it will just kill the cells. It doesn't matter. Okay, so we've covered uh, repair and we've covered reassortment. So I'll stop for a minute and ask if there's any questions. You're probably interested in the time of uh, reassortment and um, that's the time of a cell cycle, which is 12 to 24 hours. Okay, so the next R, the next a uh, factor that affects the radiation response of cells is reoxygenation. The presence of oxygen is the biggest determinant to a cell's response to radiation. It can affect the cell's re radiation response by a factor of two or even three. And so the presence of oxygen at the time of radiation is most important. This can affect the intrinsic radiation sensitivity and also the amount of repair that occurs. The oxygen, in the presence of oxygen, the damage that happens, next slide, is uh, more permanent and uh, more damaging. And so this graph showing cell survival as a function of radiation dose shows that in the presence of oxygen, the red curve is much steeper and less of a shoulder region meaning less repair and more sensitive to radiation. And in the field, we say that the radiation damage is made is fixed. What we mean is that it can't be repaired. It's made permanent. Okay, cells from a blood vessel uh, that are close to a blood vessel are well oxygenated. Uh, and those that are far from a blood vessel are at such low oxygen that they're probably dead. But those cells in between, somewhere around 100 microns, can exist, they're alive, but they're not, they're, they exist at low oxygen. And so these are the ones worried about after a radiation exposure. They can regrow and they're resistant to radiation, the so-called hypoxic group. And so I say that cancer cells, even a tenth of a millimeter from a blood vessel are deprived of oxygen and can be resistant to radiation. Next slide. So for low dose, two gray fractions of radiation, multiple small doses, allows for reoxygenation between the fractions. That is, the first fraction kills the oxygenated cells, 
those that are anoxic, we don't care about, they're dead already, and those that are hypoxic will survive that first radiation treatment. During the time, if enough time is given between the first fraction and the second fraction, and typically this is a day, of course, uh, that's enough time for oxygen to, to diffuse to those cells that uh, were previously low oxygen, and also for capillaries to grow, and uh, they grow at about a millimeter a day. Uh, next slide. So what about high-dose radiation? Well, reoxygenation can occur between uh, high-dose radiation fractions, but certainly if it's a single fraction, uh, that's not going to happen. Next slide. Well, I'll stop here after reoxygenation and uh, just uh, ask the question, um, why is it that oxygen can't diffuse more than 100 microns in living tissue? Maybe I'll give a hint. Okay. Uh, it's living tissue, so it's consuming oxygen. And so the reason oxygen, even given long enough time, doesn't diffuse more than 100 microns is because the cells are consuming it. Great, thank you, Steve. Sure, the next R, repopulation, is the growth of cancer cells growing. And of course, during a fractionated radiation therapy course, which might take six to eight weeks, um, and the initial dose may actually cut, stimulate the cells to grow, this is definitely a concern. But the growth of cancer cells during high-dose radiation, SBRT, SRS, is not a large concern. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in summary, we talked about repair, which happens in hours, reassortment, 12 hours to a day, reoxygenation, which occurs in hours to days, and repopulation, which happens over weeks, and we haven't yet talked about radiosensitivity. So these are the R's that govern radiation response um, on a cellular level. Next slide. On the left side is a graph that shows surviving fraction as a function of hours between two doses of radiation. This summarizes the four, some of the R's, of uh, three of the four R's of radiobiology. So when the two doses are separated by no time, that is when, two, when the dose is kind of twice as big, we get the most cell killing. And that's shown by this um, uh, symbol all the way to the left at zero time between the two doses. As the time between the two doses increases, the tissue, the cells are spared. And that's because repair of sublethal damage occurs in the time between two fractions. This reaches a maximum when the cells start to synchronize in the cell cycle. And um, if the cells are synchronized and they just happen to reach the most sensitive part of the cell cycle when the second dose of radiation comes, then more cells die. And so we see a decrease in the cell survival when the time between doses is uh, four to six hours. And that reaches a uh, a nadir, and then it starts to increase again as the cells synchronize through into the less resistant part of the cell cycle, and then eventually the cells grow, and that's repopulation. So a favorite question on boards is to show this curve and that, to ask people to label uh, which of these, uh, what phenomena, what R uh, corresponds to which part of the curve. Okay, on the right side is um, the the uh, impact of these on high dose radiation and repair is definitely important. Reassortment of cells in the cell cycle may have a factor, but it's not as important. Reoxygenation may, uh, and depending on if there's two, at least two fractions. Uh, repopulation, no, because uh, there's not enough time, even under fractionated conditions with high dose radiation. And radiosensitivity we're going to talk about now. So next slide. 
Okay. So if there's no questions, or if there are questions on the first four R's of radiobiology, uh, please type them. And I'll, I'll be happy to stop and answer. The fifth R of, radio of radiobiology is radiosensitivity. And the first statement is that really all mammalian cells have about the same radiation sensitivity. Uh, there's a couple exceptions. Um, lymphocytes is the big one. It takes a low dose of radiation to wipe them out. They die by a special process called apoptosis, where the cells um, effectively commit suicide. The DNA is cut up into regular pieces and it's P53 mediated, the protein involved. Um, and so we characterize the radiation response by this term D0, D0, uh, which is the dose necessary to reduce surviving fraction to 37% of its initial value. And for all mammalian cells, it's between one and two gray, remarkably consistent. And the question is, could changes in radiation sensitivity explain why SBRT, why high dose radiation, SBRT, SRS is so effective. Next slide. Okay, the focus of this talk is um, on high dose radiation. And the reason is it's gaining momentum as a therapeutic strategy for cancer. And as we heard in the last lecture, um, there's the overriding um, factors are cost, patient comfort, and some would say remarkable responses. So, and the focus here, I'm going to be on uh, brain tumors, and this is either single or multiple high dose. But what I say has a relevance for uh, tumors in any site that are treated with high dose radiation. Next slide. Okay. So for brain, cancer, there is level three evidence that SRS alone is better than whole brain radiation therapy given under a fractionated scheme. And this is that adults with newly diagnosed solid brain metastases that are amenable to SRS, that means smaller than three centimeters in maximum diameter and producing a minimal less than one centimeter midline shift mass effect are, of, are the ones of interest. Next slide. This data comes from Linsky et al. in a paper in 2010. And they showed that while this is a, a summary of the field and uh, published data, and they uh, summarized that while both single dose SRS and whole brain radiation therapy are effective for treating patients with brain metastases, single dose SRS alone appears to be superior to whole brain radiation therapy alone for patients with up to three metastatic brain tumors in terms of patient survival advantage. Next slide. All right, well, this raises some basic biological questions. If tumor hypoxia is a problem that limits the effectiveness of radiotherapy, and if fractionated radiation strategies overcome this hypoxia by the process of reoxygenation, then how is it that high dose radiation can be so effective? It suggests that these tumors are not hypoxic. And that we know is not the case because when we make direct measurements of these tumors, they are hypoxic. Next slide. Okay, there's other questions too. How in the world can we explain that some metastatic brain tumors, such as those that arise from melanoma or renal cell carcinoma or anaplastic thyroid cancer, the list goes on, considered to be radiation resistant cancers based on their response to a fractionated radiation schedule. However, when they're smaller than three centimeters, these same tumors, when metastatic, to respond better than predicted, regardless of their histology. Next slide. 
So the central thesis, at least from a radiobiological um, perspective, is that if we can understand what's going on, then we can optimize, give the, the best radiation dose, optimum number of fractions, dose per fraction, and maybe combine with some pharmacological agent that exploits this difference. Next slide. Okay, there's a number of proposed mechanisms that have been put forward to explain these, the response of single fraction or even multiple fraction high dose radiation. And these are the tumor vessels are sensitive to radiation, chronic anoxia occurs days after the radiation because of damage to the blood vessels, immunology is involved. There's a large group of investigators that say there's really no new biology that's needed. We can explain everything from the alpha beta that uh, exists for conventional low dose fractions. And maybe there's other explanations. Next slide. So I'll go through each one of these. Next. Okay, the first is tumor vessel sensitivity to radiation. And the question is, can the endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels, are they sensitive to radiation? Are they more sensitive to high dose radiation than to low dose radiation? Next slide. Mohamovitz, Friedman, Kolosnik, and Fuchs at Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Center would say yes, endothelial cells die by a special ceramide mediated apoptotic pathway. This is not the classic P53 mediated pathway. Next slide. P53 is the policeman of the cell. P53 says, oh, that DNA is damaged. We should really die. We should really cut the DNA up and kill this cell. Or, oh, this DNA is not damaged enough. Uh, let's repair. Let's go ahead and repair this damage. Um, but this is a completely separate pathway that involves ceramide and acid sphingomyelinase. Next slide. And what they showed in a very elegant study was when they took out this acid sphingomyelinase from uh, cancer cells and grew those cancer cells into a tumor, that the tumors responded, um, the, the tumors grew and didn't respond to the radiation, but when the acid sphingomyelinase was present, the tumors regressed. So this graph showed here on the right is tumor volume, as a function of days after tumor implantation. And this, the tumors that had acid sphingomyelinase intact uh, regressed after a big dose of radiation. And here we're talking 15 gray. And those there where it was knocked out and didn't have this special apoptotic pathway that specifically kills endothelial cells, the tumors grew after radiation as if they weren't affected. And so the, the Fuchs group at Sloan Kettering says there's a threshold of radiation dose that activates this special apoptotic pathway, and it's only in endothelial cells. Uh, they also showed, interestingly, that the same effect was in any endothelial cells, not just those in the cancer, but also in normal tissue. Next slide. Okay, what about chronic anoxia days after radiation? Next slide. Chang Song at the University of Minnesota and Bob Griffin at the University of Arkansas say that tumor blood flow decreases after a big dose of radiation and not after a small dose. But interestingly, after that big dose, the tumor cells are no longer supplied with oxygen and no longer have a way to get rid of waste. And so if left intact, those cells will die. Next slide. This is data from the 1970s that Chang Song um, published, showing a very large tumor, Walker 256, in rats, 
And the graph is of clonogenic fraction as a function of days after a big dose of radiation, 10 gray. And he showed that when the, immediately after a big dose of radiation, if the tumor was excised and the cells were uh, minced up and plated on a cell culture dish and allowed to grow, there was a lot of killing due to the radiation. He's down about a log and a half from the initial value. However, when that tumor was left in place for a full day or two days, he got even more cell kill, another log of cell kill. And so he hypothesized and has shown in a series of studies since then that the cells that are left in place after radiation die because they're anoxic, no oxygen and also deprived of nutrients. Next slide. It seems that um, although this observation has been, con been confirmed by a number of people, uh, it's only when there's very large tumors that are used or very large doses of radiation. And so there's some question about um, uh, if this is a wide phenomenon or if it's just specific to very large mouse and rat tumors. Next slide. Okay, so we've covered that blood vessels in the tumor uh, may be more sensitive to radiation, and I invite any questions at this point. Dr. Brown, there actually is a question. Um, the question asks, during the process of Carcinogenesis. Uh, during the process of carcinogenesis, are the indicators of apoptosis blocked? And if so, how can they be activated new, new, newly, if that makes sense? Mm. So my view um, is that apoptosis is a relatively uh, small component of cell kill, that most cells die after radiation um, by uh, mitotic cell death, and that apoptosis is a small amount of that. Um, so the question is, uh, if uh, carcinogenesis is a new cancer growth, and um, if the cells are, uh, if their DNA is damaged, and uh, if the cell's DNA is damaged but could cause cancer, um, the question is, uh, why don't they die by apoptosis? Um, and uh, in cancer cells, the answer is that uh, they seem to have escaped that mechanism uh, through mutagenesis, through uh, damage to their DNA. Uh, and it's really P53 that's the culprit, you know, this policeman of the cell. Does that answer the question? I believe so. You mean that P53 is removed? Or? It's mutated. In a, okay. more than half of cancers, P53 is mutated. Understood. I think you answered the question. Acting properly. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll move on then. The next slide. So another proposed mechanism is uh, immunologic immunological priming that uh, the immune system is involved. And this is a hot area of research currently. Uh, next slide. Sylvia Fermenti and Sarah Demaria, at, now at Cornell, um, have shown in, again, a very elegant series of studies um, over the past couple of decades that the immune system is very much engaged after a high dose of radiation. So antigens are presented that weren't previously presented, and um, the um, adaptive immune system, uh, the specific immune system, uh, T cells, uh, dendritic cells, recognize the cancer uh, after a big dose of radiation and mop it up. And this has huge implications um, 
it means that if the immune system is activated, uh, maybe that will decrease recurrences. Uh, similarly, if there's a metastatic component to the cancer, and uh, even outside the radiation field, if the immune system is primed, it may be able to uh, rid the body of metastatic disease. Um, and then there's a large, uh, a lot of interest in uh, checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1, PD-L1, which uh, cancers um, express these, um, these uh, checkpoints, which stop T cells from coming in and stop dendritic cells from coming in and recognizing the cancer as being uh, bad players. And these checkpoint inhibitors put a break on that and allow the T cells to say, ah, this is bad, this, this is foreign, we need to get rid of it. And so basic questions need to be asked like timing and sequence. Should we give radiation first and maybe wipe out the T cells, which are the most sensitive cells to radiation, and not have them available and then give uh, immunotherapy? Or should we give immunotherapy first and then give radiation? And it's not clear, but for reasons I can't explain, it looks like radiation first works better than radiation after immunotherapy. Uh, the verdict is still out, but the early data points in an in a unusual direction. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, we need to talk about um, if we really need a new biology to explain these um, remarkable responses. ¿Cuál, cuál? Sorry, is there a question? Okay. So next slide. Okay, Martin Brown and David Brenner and others have said there is no new biology that's needed. And they went back and looked at uh, radiation response to different fractions of radiation in non-small cell lung cancer. Next slide. And they showed that a single curve can pretty well fit all the data. This shows tumor control probability as a function of biologically effective dose, BED, and uh, using the alpha beta model, um, they show that um, single fraction data in red, three to eight fractions, SBRT shown in blue, and more than 10 fractions shown in green can be fit by a single line. And so they say, you know, there's no new biology that's needed. We can explain everything from the alpha beta. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. Next slide. On the left, I show tumor response as a function of dose. And so this is a dose response curve for radiation and focus on the blue line first. So at low doses, um, there's an increase in uh, tumor response as the dose increases. And um, this refers to, it, it's a fairly high dose compared to the red line. So it, it means that the cells are not that sensitive to the radiation or the tumor is not that sensitive to the radiation. And then if we pass some threshold shown by the green dotted line, uh, vertical line, then, and we jump up to the red solid curve, all of a sudden the cells or the tumors become sensitive to radiation above some threshold dose. And we know that to be about eight to 10 gray. So the resultant curve, the tumor response curve is shown on the right side where blue governs the response at the low dose region and red governs the response at the high dose and they're connected by the black line. So this is the, if, if indeed there's a threshold dose that makes high dose radiation uh, all of a sudden more sensitive, uh, it, would, it would be reflected by a curve like this. So let's revisit J Martin Brown and um, David Brenner's data. Next slide. Okay, so um, here I, 
uh, I just showed that um, at the low dose region, say um, greater than 10 fractions, you know, we're not getting a lot of tumor control. So I just focused on the one fraction and the three to eight fractions, which are probably the ones that are above the threshold. And we're asking the simple question, is there a shift in this curve from blue to red to the left? That is, when the lower doses are given, when the lower dose per fractions are given, shown in blue, do we have to shift to the left when we use higher doses? Is there a shift? Um, and it looks like there may be. There's large error bars. It's hard to tell from this data. But if there is, it's on the order of about 15 gray, which is an enormous amount. So I would say, based on this data, the verdict is still out. I can't say that the old biology is enough to explain. And uh, probably a controlled prospective studies are needed. Next slide. OK. Um, there might be some other explanations as well. Um, so next slide. So this really ends the um, kind of conventional radiobiology, uh, low dose and also high dose. And um, I do have some additional slides that uh, I can present that show um, data from our lab that suggests that there might be other mechanisms. But I think um, I'll ask Benjamin, it's eight o'clock. And um, oh, what do you think? Should we, should we close it and leave the slides to let people look at it at their leisure? Or I'm happy to spend a couple of minutes and go through them completely up to you, you and, and the group. I think let's ask uh, the audience if they would prefer us to continue with a few more slides. Or does anyone have any questions? So this is work from Henry Ford Hospital. And you can scan through, Ben. I'll just uh, talk as you scan. Uh, this is work done by Jim Ewing and me at Henry Ford. Um, and what we looked at was using MRI, uh, you can go to the next slide, uh, to look at measured uh, changes in blood flow as a function of time and changes in vessel permeability. Next slide. Um, and also the extravascular volume. Uh, these studies were done in rats. And we looked at, after a big dose of radiation, uh, without killing an animal, as all the studies by Song and uh, Robert Griffin, uh, you had to euthanize the animal to get a measurement. Uh, in these, this case, we could measure in the same animal, two hours, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, 24 after radiation. Next slide. We didn't expect to see much. This was actually a control study. Uh, this shows that the tumors were implanted in the brain. Next slide. And these were human tumors. Uh, this just shows the parameters, next slide, that were measured. Again, tumor blood flow and vascular permeability and extravascular space. Uh, this just shows that 20 gray is enough to cause uh, a lot of change to the tumor. So um, survival was increased from 30 days to 100 days with 20 gray. Next slide. So this is the data. This is a percent change in tumor blood flow as a function of time after treatment. And if you would have asked me what I predicted, I would have said, there's probably no changes. You know, after a big dose of radiation, you may see a little erythema on the skin, but uh, that takes days. I wouldn't expect any big changes. But based on Song's data and um, Robert Griffin's data, um, it, it looks consistent. There was a big decrease in blood flow, but it didn't stay low. And this, after 20 gray, it didn't stay low, but it actually increased and it went above what it was the day before. Next slide. We also looked at normal tissue and saw fluctuations plus or minus 20%, which is what you would normally see in normal tissue. Next slide. And so when we compared tumor to normal tissue, it was the first time in my knowledge that there's a difference that can explain high dose radiation response in normal tissue and tumor. You know, one of the big questions is, oh sure, tumors respond, but why doesn't normal tissue? Why don't you get these big changes? Um, Fuchs and his colleagues at Sloan Kettering showed that endothelial cells die by apoptosis regardless of normal tissue or tumor. 
um, uh, from NT and Demeria showed um, immune priming should happen in normal tissue or tumor as long as the dose is high enough. And so it was interesting that this was a differential response. And it was clear in every animal that was looked at, five out of five uh, in 25 total, um, exactly the same thing happened. Next slide. Uh, next slide. This is just details. This is the histology. Next slide. And we'll go through the next. This is apoptosis. Next slide. It just shows that, um, yes, damage occurred. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what's going on? Well, if we saw a decrease in blood flow and an increase in blood flow in the brain after a stroke or in the heart after a heart attack, we would call that ischemia reperfusion. And we would say that causes a lot of extra damage. And that, that's over and above what the heart attack or what the stroke causes. It's the reflowing of blood flow to the region that causes tremendous amount of damage, and it's through free radicals. And interestingly, in the 1990s, Parkins and his colleagues at uh, the Gray Labs in the UK showed that if they just clamp the tumor, regardless of radiation, if they just physically clamp the tumor with a tourniquet and then opened it up, that uh, the tourniquet by itself, that the ischemia by itself, did not cause much damage, uh, actually no damage. But if they allowed one day for the reperfusion to do its thing, it causes a tremendous amount of cell kill. And they could get rid of that cell kill by giving something that scavenged free radicals, either superoxide dismutase or catalase. And so they attributed ischemia reperfusion uh, injury occurring in a tumor if you could clamp a tumor and open it up. Uh, so it was a surprise to us to see what looks like an ischemia reperfusion going on in after a big dose of radiation. Next slide. So, uh, Dr. Brown, are you saying that when we're delivering even just single high doses, that the damage to the tumor is more than just the damage from the radiation, but we're actually evoking uh, the body's biologic response, which causes further damage via the ischemia reperfusion mechanism. That's the hypothesis, right? Unproven, but that's the hypothesis. So this is more like future work. Next slide. So the process is shown here that ischemia causes the degradation of ATP into hypoxanthine, And in the presence of oxygen and a reperfusion, that hypoxanthine becomes xanthine, and in the presence of oxygen, causes these tremendously damaging free radicals, either oxygen or nitrogen free radicals. Next slide. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, exactly what Benjamin said. High dose radiation may cause more damage above the radiation due to free radicals and more cell kill. And if that's the case, and we really don't know if that happens in humans, uh, but uh, it's an area of interest and in research, that uh, why couldn't we give an agent that increases free radicals just at that time and get more bang for your buck and get more cell killing, maybe even under a fractionated uh, low-dose schedule if we give free radicals just at that time. And so I'll conclude here, but to say that there's many interesting drugs, including chemotherapeutic agents, that increase free radicals and uh, this is an area that um, I would hope to interest some people in the audience uh, to pursue. So thank you very much. That concludes my talk.